Good morning. We're streaming live this morning with our brand new camera. So I want to thank you uh, for everyone who gave uh, in order to provide this valuable resource for us. Uh, not only will you be able to, to view our services on Facebook now, uh, but later they will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can simply go to our website, calvary-hill.org, click on sermons, and then video, and you'll be able to view uh, our Sunday services uh, really from now on. Uh, so we're excited about that. I also want to thank each and every one of you who have taken the time to mail or to deliver your tithe checks to the church. Uh, we even had a delivery this morning. I thank the Lord for that. Also want to thank all of you who have been faithful to give online, especially those of you who have just started doing that in this last month. Your financial faithfulness uh, during these difficult days of sheltering at home uh, are truly critical. So uh, please uh, stay on top of that. I want to uh, also just share this news with you. Currently, we know of no one in our church family who has tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, so we're excited about that and we hope that you will continue to do those things that keep you and your family safe. Also want you to know that our church staff is always available to you by phone. Uh, we have also been in the office and will continue to be Monday through Thursday until noon or a little bit after uh, lunchtime. Uh, at this time though, I do want to uh, let you know we have no plans of resuming our regular schedule. Uh, so uh, no uh, Lord's Supper service and luncheon uh, this next Sunday, Palm Sunday. No plans at this time to even gather on Easter Sunday morning, uh, but we will keep you updated with that information uh, as, uh, as we make those kinds of decisions. But we are praying uh, and know that you are praying as well that uh, here pretty soon we're going to be able to start gathering together again. Until then, uh, stay at home as much as you possibly can. Uh, check on one another. Uh, when you are able to do so. I want to share with you just a, a quick story, something I, something I heard this week uh, that uh, is probably just one of, of several or perhaps even many stories like this. Uh, I had called uh, Terry and Joyce Baker to speak to them uh, and found out that uh, Lisa and Leonard Knight uh, had called earlier to check on them uh, to make sure that they had groceries and everything that they needed. Terry assured uh, Lisa and Leonard that they had been to the store and everything was just fine. They had everything they needed. However, Terry added that uh, when they were at the grocery store, the, the store was out of milk. Uh, he just kind of mentioned this in passing. Well, evidently, uh, later that day, Lisa and Leonard were speaking with Dale and Vicki Arrington and kind of told them uh, about uh, Terry and Joyce. And the next thing you know, Terry said there was a knock at his front door and there was Brother Dale Arrington with a gallon of milk uh, in his hand. And uh, so uh, that's the way that this is supposed to work. And that's what I mean by checking on one another, taking care of one another. So I just want to thank you for all of you who are doing those kinds of things. And then I just want to add this. As we continue to battle uh, the coronavirus, please rest assured that God is in control. Uh, this worldwide pandemic has not caught him by surprise. Nothing ever does. Uh, not only, as I shared with you last week, does our God work all things together for the good of those that love him, those of us who are called according to his purpose, but also according to Ephesians 1.11, he works all things according to the counsel of his will. So what does that mean for us? Well, it means simply this, that this virus is not a setback for God's plan. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's a part of God's plan. And I know that's sometimes difficult for us. And even though it may not be exactly clear as to why all of this is happening, we can rest assured that God has a divine purpose in all that is happening. So continue to spend time in his word and in prayer. God's word is true. Rest assured that our future is secure. And I just want to read a passage from Lamentations chapter three, beginning in verse 21. And the prophet says, but I call this to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. 
Let's pray together this morning as we continue our service. Father, we are so thankful today for the assurance that you are seated squarely upon your throne. Lord, we are equally reassured in knowing that our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ is seated at your right hand, ever living, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. What a glorious hope we have in him. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would bless our worship service, bless this time together uh, with our people and with all of those who will will join us in this uh, live stream service. Lord, uh, thank you again for those who made uh, this wonderful technology possible for our church. And we just ask you, as we do each and every time we gather together, speak to our hearts as only you can, Father. Encourage us with that still, small voice And Lord, we pray if there is a single soul who is watching this morning um, that does not know Jesus as Savior and Lord, we ask that you might do what only you can do, Father, save that soul. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Because he overcame, we overcome. Psalm 34 says this, David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. I will boast in the Lord. The humble will hear and be glad. Proclaim the Lord's greatness with me. Let us exalt his name together. Hold on just a sec. There we go. I sought the Lord. And he answered me, and he rescued me from all of my fears. Those who look to him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and it rescues them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in him. Work up. 
Let me just say that, um, as Brother James said, this is the very first time that we are using our new equipment, which means anytime you use new digital and audio and video equipment, inevitably there's going to be glitches. We were on the phone getting everything fixed and ready to go about 10 minutes before start because we were having issues. Um, so I can't guarantee that we won't still have issues um, as the stream goes along. Just know, if there's a glitch, if there's a pause, if something stops, um, I have a, my main man, Chase McCarg, is going to get it up and running again. And if he doesn't, we're not going to pay him this week what we were going to pay him, which was nothing to begin with. So it doesn't matter. But Chase will get it up and running. I promise he'll get it up and running. Chase, will be good right now? We're live now, Chase? All right. All right. We're good now. We have been doing a series. This is the sixth sermon of a series discussing how we overcome in Christ. The title of this series has simply been Overcome. Uh, I want to start with a quote this morning from C.S. Lewis in his sermon turned book, The Weight of Glory. Here's what he says. We do not merely, 
want to see beauty or glory. Though God knows that is bounty enough. We want something else, something which can hardly be put into words. To be united to the beauty and glory we see. To pass into it. To receive it into ourselves. To bathe in it and to become part of it. I'm going to make a confession to you this morning. I'm a glory seeker. I've always been a glory seeker. I long to be given glory and I long to experience glory. Now, some people may say, well, that's just a result of sin. Neil. You just have prideful flesh and um, that's the reason why you are a glory seeker. Some may say it's because of early childhood development. Blame my mom and dad. Um, while others may attribute it to a quirk in my personality type. But I believe there is a deeper and more fundamental reason why I seek glory. God made me this way. In fact, I would argue that God has made all of mankind as glory seekers. It doesn't take a very deep look into Scripture to find out that God Himself is a glory seeker. God seeks His own glory. And if we have been made in the image of God, then we have been made to revel in, to reflect upon, and to experience His glory. Our own longing for, for glory can be seen in, in, and maybe can it help us understand some of the obsessions that we have. For instance, sporting championships. We want to win because we want glory. Military victories. Hollywood fame. Shiny new cars and houses. This explains why mankind has this obsession with glory. The tragedy is, is that mankind... Uh, is not that mankind seeks glory. That's not the problem. The problem is that we swallow false glory instead of true glory. We swallow the false glory of sin. We distort, uh, we, we swallow the distorted glory of the flesh. We love the vain glory of the praise of man. The problem is not that we seek glory. We've been made this way. We're supposed to seek glory. The issue is that we settle and we, we take in glory that is not the glory of God. Lewis was right. We don't just want to see God's glory. We're not just glory seekers so that we can see it. Somehow, we want to become part of the glory itself. And the wonder of the gospel is that Jesus Christ came to redeem us in order that we see and partake in His glory. This is why Jesus prayed what He did in John chapter 17. This has been the text that we have been working through in this series Jesus has been praying all of these things coming on the heels of Him saying, I have overcome the world. And then He prays this prayer. And at the end, He prays something that is so remarkable and so beautiful, it can hardly be contained or put into words. I want to start in verse 24, read down through verse 26 of John chapter 17. Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you. And these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name. I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The first thing I want to talk about this morning is found at the very beginning of verse 24 where Jesus prays, He says, Father, I desire. Um, our longing for glory, our desire to experience glory, 
To see the glory of God and to experience the glory of God, to partake in the glory of God is not just wishful thinking on our part. It is, in fact, the will of Jesus. That word that the ESV translates, Father, I desire, many other translations simply translate it will. And I think that is a better English understanding of this word, the, the will of Jesus. Father, I will. Jesus is expressing his sovereign, salvific will for his people. He's saying, Father, I will that they also those you have given me. Jesus sovereignly desires, he sovereignly wills that all of the people he is saving will see his glory and partake in his glory. So the hope of this glory, the hope that we're going to see the glory of God, the hope that we are going to experience, partake in, become a part of the glory of God is held up by nothing less than the salvific will of God the Son for the people that God the Father has given him. This is not wishful thinking. This is not something that we just wish is going to happen someday. This is a guarantee. Jesus is praying, Father, I'm willing it. I'm desiring, I'm willing that these people you gave me to save will be with me and see my glory and partake in my glory. There is not a 99.9% .9 chance that you will see the glory of God one day and that you will partake of the glory of God one day. There is a 100% chance that all the Father gave the Son will experience that. But Jesus says something very specific in regards to his glory and his people. Look at what he says in verse 24. Father, I desire, I will, that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. Now, we need to talk about this where I am. If I were to ask most Christians where Jesus is right now, where is Jesus right now? right now. I think the default quick answer we would give would be heaven. Where is Jesus right now? Heaven. Now, of course, when most people think of heaven, unfortunately, they think of some cloudy, floaty place somewhere up there. No, I don't think Jesus is talking about an upwards, cloudy, floaty, heavenly place. In fact, I don't think specifically Jesus is talking about a general heaven at all. I don't think Jesus is talking about a general heaven. I don't think he's saying, Father, I desire that all these that you have given me should be with me in heaven. Even though that is true, I don't think that's what he's talking about here. I think it's more specific. Let me ask you this question. After Jesus has been crucified, resurrected, he then gets exalted. Where does he get exalted to? Let me give you the answer from Ephesians chapter 1, verse 20 through 23, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. First, Ephesians 1, 20 through 23. That he, God, worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as, as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purifications for sin, he sat down at the right hand of, ma of the majesty on high. So if I were to ask you, how does the New Testament, when the New Testament talks about Jesus being exalted and going somewhere, it doesn't speak of a general heaven. It's more specific than that. The exaltation speaks of Jesus being in the throne room of God at the right hand of the Father. 
So, if I were to ask you the question again, where is Jesus right now? The specific answer is, He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is seated on the throne of God at the right hand of majesty on high. For what purpose? What is the purpose? Jesus goes on to say that He wants His people to be with Him where He is, and now we know more specifically what that is. I want my people to be with me in the throne room of God at the Father's right hand in order that they see my glory. That's what He says in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also, whom You have given me, may be where I am to see my glory. Now, I know I'm asking a lot of questions, but I think this is a way of helping understand. I'm just trying to define these things for us, right? So we need to ask the question, where is Jesus? When he says, see my glory, what glory are we talking about? Um, Is this just some bright light that Jesus wants us to see? Is is that what it is that we are going to see? Just this bright, shining glory. And that's it. Now you need to understand, when this language of the throne room of God and a seat seated beside the Father, the Father is a spirit. The Father does not have a human body. Okay, We need to understand that real quick, right? The Father is a spirit who does not have a human body. Now Jesus has a human body, but the Father doesn't. So when the image of of God the Father sitting on the throne, all right, that is symbolic language for us. That's a picture for us because God the Father can't sit. He doesn't have knees that will bend and he can't sit down upon a throne. He is a spirit. So this language that is being used here is symbolic language, it's picture language to help us grasp a concept, to help us get a hold in our minds what it is that that is being talked about here. So when Jesus says, I'm I'm sitting at the right hand of the Father and I want them to be with me where I am so they can see my glory, we need to understand what glory is being talked about here. What glory does Jesus receive by his exaltation to the right hand of the Father as the God-man? Well, Ephesians 1 that we read a moment ago helps us right off the bat. Let me read part of this again. It says, He worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated him at the right hand in heavenly places, far above, listen to this, far above all rule, and authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come, that he may put all things under his feet, gave him the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And Revelation chapter 5 goes on to talk about this this same kind of thing. Jesus being above all authority and having all power and dominion on the earth, everything being placed under his feet. In Revelation chapter 5, we have this beautiful throne room picture where God the Father is seated on the throne and God the Son comes and takes the scroll that nobody else could take. Of course, John in Revelation is weeping because he doesn't know who can take the scroll. Who's going to be able to take the scroll and open it? I believe that scroll is a picture of uh, of the history of mankind, the story that God is telling. Who is in charge of opening it up and who has the the authority to do so? In Revelation chapter 5, Jesus, the lamb who was slain, takes the scroll from the hand of God the Father. And in verse 12, a new song is sung. And this song is sung by all of creation. It says this, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So when we think about trying to get an understanding of what glory Jesus wants us to see. It is not a gener- it's not in a generic heaven. 
All right? We are in the throne room of God. It is Jesus sit, sitting at the right hand of the Father. And it is not just some generic bright light, even though I'm sure it will be glorious and bright and beautiful. Um, there is a specific glory that he wants us to see. It is the fact that Jesus Christ has been crowned king over everything. He has been given rule and authority and reign over the entire universe. That Hebrews uh, 1 verse 3, it says he upholds all things by the word of his power. Everything has been given to Jesus. So the glory that we're supposed to see is Jesus at the right hand of the Father. And, and we are supposed to revel in his kingship, revel in his lordship, revel in the fact that everything has been placed underneath his feet and all power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing have been given to him forever and ever. And God gives all of this to Jesus because he loves him. That's what he says back in John chapter 17. Jesus says, you've done this for me because you love me before the foundation of the world. I want them to be where I am to see my glory that you've given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. And just as God the Father loves the Son and is giving all of this to the Son, Jesus loves us, those that He is saving. And He desires that where He is, we will be. And we will see His glory as the sovereign ruler of the universe. However, Jesus doesn't stop there, He's not done. Now it's going to get really crazy. Verse 25, Jesus states, O righteous Father, the world does not know you. This does not mean that the salvific mission of Jesus has failed. Because Jesus has manifested the Father to all the Father has given Him. We've seen this over and over again in John chapter 17. The whole world doesn't know the Father. It's not like every single person head for head knows the Father. But those that the Father has given Jesus out of the world, they know the Father and they know Jesus whom the Father sent. You can see that again in verses 6 through 8 of John chapter 17. Now, what is eternal life according to Jesus in John chapter 17? It's to know the Father and the Son. So Jesus is in essence saying, Father, the world doesn't know you. The world doesn't have eternal life. The world doesn't have this new creation life. But those you've given me out of the world, they do have this new creation life. They do have this, this eternal life because they do know you and the one you have sent. And by the way, it is going to take eternal new creation life in order to stand in the, the throne room of God and to look upon the glory of Jesus. If you don't have a new creation life, if you don't have eternal life, if you don't know the Father and the Son, then you will never be able to stand in the presence of God's glory and bask in it and see it. It's never going to happen for you. Only those who have this eternal life the elect that God has given eternal life. Those are the ones who are going to be able to stand before the Father. But I want you to look at how this prayer ends in verse 26. He says, I'm going to continue to make this known. I've made your name known. I will continue to make it known. Which I think, by the way, means two things. I think, I think number one, it means more people. All right, those you've given me, that people are still being saved. So there are people that the Father has given the Son that have not yet had the Father made known to them, but that's going to happen. And we are going to grow more and more in our understanding and knowledge of this eternal life and this new creation life that God has given. But that's a side note. I want you to focus on this. Jesus says that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is similar to what Jesus says in verse 21 when he says, You, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Now, I'll be honest with you, I don't really know how to explain this. 
This is, as C.S. Lewis said, something that can hardly be put into words. Because this goes beyond just seeing the glory of Jesus. This is being united to it. This is passing into it. This is receiving it into ourselves, bathing in it, and becoming part of it. I mean, listen to this. It says, Jesus says, Father, I want the love that you have for me to be the love they have for me, and I want to be in them. And then he says in verse 21, you in me, I in you, and them in us. How do you even begin to comprehend this? Somehow Jesus is talking about a unity, a, a bringing together, a oneness that God is going to have with his people Where we are going to love the Father and the Son and they're going to love us. We're going to be in them. They're going to be in us, the Holy Spirit. It is something that that we can't fully wrap our minds around. When we try to begin to explain it, words fall short. Listen listen to a couple of the passages of scriptures that that might help us a little bit. Romans chapter 8 verse 17. If children, if children of God, then heirs. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. I don't even know. I can't even comprehend what that means. Think about that. Somehow, as as Jesus is glorified, we, those that he is saving, are going to be glorified with him. Not that we're going to be glorified over here separately, but we're going to be glorified with him somehow. The glory that he has is somehow something that we're going to partake in and we're going to be glorified in this unity. Even crazier still is Revelation 3.21. This is the verse that just blows my mind. Revelation 3.21. To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I conquered and sat down with my father. Now, now stop for a minute. That, can't, that cannot mean what I think it means. Is Jesus really saying to all of my people who are going to conquer the world because I've conquered the world, those of you that conquer the world are going to sit with me on my throne. You see why it can't be like a literal throne with a seat? We're all just going to like pile up in his lap. That wouldn't make any sense. We're talking pictures here, right? Jesus is saying, I've conquered and I've sat down on my father's throne. And in the same way, you who conquer are going to sit with me on my throne. You remember just a few minutes ago, When I said what this glory was all about. What is this glory all about? When we're talking about Jesus, us seeing the glory of God, are we not talking about His rule and authority over the earth? Similarly, when we see the glory of Jesus... And we, the, the, the overcomers, the conquerors, when we are taken into that glory, when we partake of that glory, when we are united with it, we too will rule and reign with Jesus over the earth. So when we get that glory, when we're glorified with Jesus, we become those who rule and reign with Him. Just as God the Father turns and gives all the glory to Jesus, Jesus, our benevolent brother King, takes everything and turns to the people that He saved and He gives all the glory to them and they get to rule and reign with Christ forever and ever as children of God. Back to Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain. And by your blood you ransomed people from God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Now listen to this. 
All these people that he has saved from every tribe and nation, language, people. You have made them a kingdom and a priest to our God. Listen to this. And they shall reign on the earth. So let me sum up what we have here. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays, not wishful thinking, not just let's see if this comes about one day. This is Jesus saying, I sovereignly will this, that all the Father gives me, all those that Jesus saves, should be where Jesus is. Specifically, he's talking about the seat of majesty at the right hand of the Father. And when he wills that his people see his glory, the glory that he is talking about is his sovereign rule, authority, and dominion over the earth. Jesus desires that we see that in the most glorious of ways. But... He doesn't just will that we should be there to see His glory, but that we should become in some way one with it. In some way, we get united to this glory as heirs and overcomers with Christ. And therefore, Jesus wills that we rule and reign with Him over the earth. So I have said these things to you That in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Our world is crazy right now, is it not? I mean, things are just a little bit nuts. More nuttier and crazier than I have ever seen in my lifetime. We are going through hardships and in varying degrees all over the world. The people of God are are experiencing hardships. They're experiencing persecution. They're experiencing struggles. they're, they're, They're battling sin. And I don't know what it is you're going through. I don't know what it is in your life. I don't know what hardship you're dealing with. It may be a financial hardship. It may be a physical hardship, some kind of sickness. It may be... um, that you're battling and wrestling with some sin in your life, Christian, something that you're just waging war with. I don't know what it is, but I know it's true for all of us. We are experiencing tribulation of some sort, every single one of us. But when I think about this prayer Jesus prayed, when I think about these verses that we just looked to, Whatever it is you're dealing with, sickness, finances, maybe you're just going stir crazy at home. I I don't know what it is. Some sin that you're battling. But I do know this. If you are truly born again, if you belong to Christ, you will overcome that thing. You will overcome that thing. Because Jesus has overcome the world, you overcome the world. You will overcome that thing. That's not, that's not a, there's not a 90% chance you're going to overcome it. There's not a 99% chance you're going to overcome it. It is the sovereign will of your Savior that you overcome that thing. Church, one day... All of these tribulations and hardships and battles and struggles and fights that we have will be done away with and we will be standing with them under our feet because of Jesus. They will all be under our feet. Marital struggles under our feet. Battles with children and under our feet. Battles with sin under our feet. Enemies of the gospel under our feet. And we will stand in the presence of Almighty God. We will see Jesus as King and Ruler, Lord of Lords, King of Kings over everything. He will take us by the hand and He will give us that glory. We will partake in it. We will bathe in it. We will will be taken into it and united in some way that I cannot even grasp. 
and then God is going to turn us loose over this world to rule it and reign it forever and ever and ever as conquerors and overcomers, heirs of the throne of God. I do not know anything else that could be of more comfort to us this morning than to know where this all ends. Jesus is praying this the night before he dies. He's basically saying, I'm fixing to go make all this possible. So church, have peace. Take heart. Your King and your Lord has overcome the world. He has overcome whatever battles you're facing. And I know the end of your story. You know the end of your story. And if you are home watching this, or maybe you're, you're not watching it live, you're going to catch it later on YouTube, or you're going to catch it later on Facebook, and you have never surrendered your life to Jesus, then this world is going to overcome you. It will destroy you. But there is a peace that I've come to know. When my heart and my flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul that can say it is well. Jesus has overcome. If you don't know him, you can't say that this morning. You can't say that in your heart. Then you'll be overcome. But that doesn't have to be the case. If you'll repent of the sin of unbelief, the sin of living your own life, the sin of trying to fight your own battles and do your own thing, and you will humble yourself before the one that God the Father has exalted as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will save you, change your life. He will give you this hope and this peace inside of you that you cannot explain. And He will guarantee that one day you will be taken, bathed in, united with His glory in such a way that you yourself will rule and reign over the earth. Let us pray. Lord, I come to you and I thank you, God, for this morning. I thank you, Lord, for the, the time that we've been able to spend in your word. Lord, uh, um, this is weird for all of us. It's strange for all of us. Um, Lord, singing to a, a camera, preaching to a camera. And, um, Lord, watching this from home or listening to this um, from home, Lord, is, this is a, a weird time for all of us. And if we simply look with human eyes, it seems like, Lord, that everyone is overwhelmed. But the truth is, is that your people have already overcome this. We're not fighting from a place uh, uh, of trying to get victory. We're fighting from victory because you have already won. This situation in our life, Lord, right now is not capable of overcoming your people. It cannot happen. So Lord, I, uh, I pray that we remember that this morning. We remember our ultimate destiny. We remember who you've made us to be. We remember what you have accomplished for us. And if there's anyone who does not know you, Lord, I pray that you would draw them under yourself. Grant them repentance and faith that they may be saved. We thank you for this morning. We thank you for your love for us, for what you've accomplished on our behalf, for your glory, and I guess for ours as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.